What was a special blessing for me this week is the amount of uh, solicitation and support and prayer that I received from our congregational mishpacha. Uh, it seemed like you all were worried that I might be beamed up prematurely. And uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful um, for the support and the prayers. Um, it's a special blessing for me to know that prayer goes up each Shabbat. Uh, not so much for me personally, but for what is spoken uh, scripturally. And that's something we solicit, we covet. Uh, prayers of everyone, but particularly those who have been called to intercession, uh, because preaching uh, and speaking the Word of God, whether it's from, uh, from the sermon or from the drash, as Alain did earlier, um, is not merely us standing and palavering, folks. And yes, each one of us that, that presents the Word of God uh, takes all kinds of time uh, to prepare and, and pray and get the sermon from the Lord. But folks, ultimately what comes out in the communication process from what goes from our mouth to what it is that you hear uh, better be something that God is doing. Because otherwise what takes place here is nothing more than public speaking. And public speaking has some value, but folks, I don't know about you all, we, I desperately want that what takes place is that God will be the one who does the speaking. And it is extremely humbling for me uh, on a given Shabbat to have people come up and say, did you have me in mind? And the short version, of course, is not. Uh, by the way, this bony finger has been retired a long time ago. The notion that I can stand here and zoom in to people's specific life issues. Um, after 30 years, I know who is God and who is not. Uh, he knows our hearts. He knows our situation. And, and so um, I'm grateful for the fact that there have been all kinds of prayer go up. Um, you may know some of the folks who are involved in intercession at Yeshua Tzion. And let me just toss in a, uh, a commercial here. Uh, first of all, all of us have been called to be intercessors. Right? No. Am I speaking Chinese? Uh, or Swahili? Uh, Klingon! There you go. Um, we've all been called into deeper and fuller uh, degrees of prayer. So all of us are in a steep learning curve when it comes to that. But some folks have been especially called and gifted. And, and so we're blessed that God has been growing us as an intercessory congregation. We want more of that. Um, because we want Yeshua Tzion to be about Yeshua, right? We want our life to be about Yeshua. Um, yes, we're busy, and yes, we're doing this, that, and the other. However, what defines our life ultimately is God's presence, the fact that He is engaged with us, the fact that His Spirit is empower us, empowering us to live the kind of life He wants. Otherwise, folks, we're just like the, um, the, the folks out there who have no hope. We do, because we know the Lord is with us. And last Shabbat, and the Shabbat before, we've been looking at the life of, of Saul. Very complicated individual. Uh, a very puzzling story, because in lots of ways, his story doesn't fit the biblical narrative. Um, but just a couple of things. Uh, we've been seeing that the Spirit of God came on Saul powerfully. The Hebrew word salach means to, to come on him uh, powerfully, suddenly, and tr transformatively. 
so that he was able to do what God called him to do and that is to be a deliverer, a Messiah type for the people of Israel uh, to deliver them from the oppression of the Philistines. Um, and he did some of that um, but the more we dig deeper into Saul's life we see why he was not able to compl complete the job. And it seems sometimes that the way God responded to him was somewhat harsh. Um, and it kind of seems to fit the, the stereotype of the angry God in the Old Testament, um, which of course is a, a bum rap. Um, because we really don't understand what is going on in, in Saul's life and who he was, how we responded to God. And we just want to pause for a minute and give you a heads up that we'll be going over this time. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we thank you for your mercy and your truth. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, what you do in our life. We simply ask, Lord, for discernment to know what is your word and your will for each one of us. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. So last Shabbat we looked at the fact that in lots of ways Saul was no different than you and I. I'm not talking about any, anybody out here. Um, Saul uh, was what I would call a uh, blame shifter. A situation came up and he was confronted with his actions and what was Saul's response? They did it. The problem is out there. I'm okay, you're dysfunctional. So first of all, he's, uh, we see that the Philistines are uh, around, gathering around with their, with their chariots, i.e. their tanks. Um, the rank and file are freaking out, They're, the army is melting and Saul feels the need to, to take action. He brings the sacrifice. Um, Samuel of course is to blame because Samuel said I'll be in seven days he doesn't show up. And he does what I think all of us would do. There is a problem, by golly we're going to fix it, right? Never mind that God has a plan that God wants his plan to take place. And so last Shabbat Samuel reads him the riot act and says to him you have acted foolishly. By the way you blew it. Foolishness is not about intellectual or cognitive smarts. Foolishness is about spiritual uh, lack of discernment. Um, and what we see again and again with Saul is unwillingness to take responsibility for his action. Um, again, in chapter 13, he's, he is blaming the, the army. Uh, the people were scattering and you, Samuel, did not come, etc., etc. So, judgment comes on him, but it's not final. The judgment in chapter 13 in this situation with the Philistines is that God says to him, because you did what you did, you demonstrated the fact that you are not fit to lead this country from generation to generation. In other words, to have a dynasty continue. Um, however, God continues to give him chances again and again and again. And to some extent, Saul lives up to it. In chapter 14, we see the fact that Saul is very diligent in pursuing his enemies. He fights very uh, bravely. Uh, this is chapter 14 verse 47 to 48. And God blesses his efforts. It's not as if God says to him, you blew it once, forget it, your history. Uh, God gives him opportunities and Saul takes advantage of those opportunities. But what we see with Saul again and again is that God plays a very little 
role in what he does. Again, it's all about Saul. Um, last Shabbat we saw, chapter 14, that Saul builds an altar to the Lord and Scripture is very emphatic that this was the first time that Saul built an altar to, to God. What's the big deal about that? Well, as we saw uh, in the drash that Ellen presented and elsewhere, uh, the, men, the men of God, the, the giants of faith, regularly, regularly seek God through the building of altar and bringing sacrifices. With Saul, it's a one-time deal. Um, so God gives him another opportunity. And from our perspective, it's, it's a difficult, difficult commission. Um, God tells him to go after the Amalekites. Now, just to give you a bit of background here, um, there's been a lot said about the so-called holy wars in Scripture and the fact that God expected Israel to uh, be merciless about some of the enemies. Um, however, that was very, very selective because, remember folks, the operative principle as far as God is concerned is that he is merciful. When God reveals himself to, to Moses, uh, he says to him, first of all, I am compassionate, merciful, full of grace and truth. And only secondarily does he say to Moses, I punish those who sin against me for the third and fourth generation. But the Amalekites were, were considered one of a kind. And there was something about the Amalekites that just set God's teeth on edge. Um, and it's very peculiar that right next to the Amalekites, there was another group of non-Israelite, Gentile uh, tribe called the Canaanites, from whom, for instance, we have Jethro. And the Canaanites reached out when Israel came out of Egypt and were very kind and gracious. The Amalekites, on the other hand, were predatory. In Deuteronomy chapter uh, 25, which is a uh, Moses amplification, kind of a rewind of what took place in Exodus 17. Uh, to, to backtrack just for a minute, Israel came out of, uh, out of Egypt. They were in the desert. It was hot. There was no water. They were in a place called Refidim. And the people quarreled and they basically said, God, you had nothing better to do than to bring us out into the desert to kill us. That, folks, is called murmuring. Not just garden variety complaining. It's murmuring. Complaining is quenching is saying, God, I'm thirsty. I'm having a hard time. That's complaining. Murmuring is saying, God, you, you are really mean and you have nothing better to do than to make me suffer. That's murmuring. That's what the Israelites were doing. And so because of that, this place became known as Masa Umeriba, a place of quarreling and testing. Uh, so you can understand that Israel at that point was not exactly in great shape. And that is when the Amalekites chose to come and attack Israel. And, and in Deuteronomy 25, we see Moses kind of giving us a, a, a backdrop and saying what the Amalekites did is they went after the weak and the sick. Which gives us a perspective, a different perspective that says that these guys were predators. Um, I mean, it's okay in the animal world. It is not okay among humans for people to be predatory. God does not like predators, folks. And, and what he said in Exodus 17 and in Deuteronomy 25 is real harsh. But remember that this was very focused on a specific group of people because of their actions. God said, I will wipe out for sure the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. 
And then he continues, this is in Exodus 17, he continues by saying, um, I declare that I am making a war against the Amalekai from generation to generation. Now you don't find that in scripture referring to anybody else. And it's hard stuff, folks. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it's easy for us. Especially from a 21st century perspective. However, I've lived long enough and I understand that God has not called me to apologize for God or to presume that I fully understand His plans and purposes other than to see what Scripture says. And the Word of God makes it very clear that God expressed His great hostility towards the Amalekites. And God commissions, and, and by the way, just to, to backtrack some more, in case you have any doubts about that, how God, what God thinks about predators, uh, let me just read to you a very strong statement in the Torah. Do not mi mistreat an alien or oppress him, for you were aliens in Egypt, do not take advantage of a widow or an orphan, if you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly heal, hear their cry and my anger will be aroused and I will kill you with a sword. So, scary stuff. However, it, it is important for us to understand God's judgment. Why? So that we don't go there. So that we clearly understand what is acceptable behavior as far as God is concerned, what is not. God commissions Saul to go and destroy the Amalekites. And Saul does his level best to do what he felt was the right thing to do. Now, I'm, I'm phrasing it specifically that way because one of the things you find about Saul is he is a big uh, justifier. He feels the need to prove to, to God and to everybody else that he is always right. Um, so he destroyed people. He destroyed the Amalekites other than the Amalekites' property. And, and this is so, in so many ways, typical of us sometimes, sometimes, when we feel that God gives us a commission that is radical, we want to argue with God. Do you ever argue with God? By the way, that's a very Jewish thing, to argue with God and say, God, you're right, uh, so far, but, but you're asking me to do this, and that's kind of over, over the top. Just imagine if Abraham said to God, God, um, what you're asking me is over the top, and I will sacrifice anything. But in any event, all the valuable property of the Amalekites was spared. The, the, the best uh, the best animals, the property, and uh, God is angry. Why? Because Saul, you're in a position of authority. And remember what we've been seeing over and over again, that we who have been called and given authority, been given responsibility, have a greater responsibility, folks, before God. All of us are responsible. However, remember what Yeshua said, to whom much is given, much is required. If God trusts and trusts into your hands, greater degree of authority and responsibility, in some sort of headship, He will expect you to fulfill that. And especially in this day and age where we are big on self-justification, we need to remember that. So. Saul does exactly that. Um, 
Look with me at verse 13 of chapter 15. Um, Saul says to Samuel, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instruction. And the Hebrew is very emphatic. I have established the Lord's instructions. In other words, I've carried everything to a T. And then he goes on to re repeat that when he's confronted by Samuel. Again, I did obey the Lord. I went on a mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. I'm okay. I'm okay. There's something wrong with you, Samuel. I'm okay. And here comes in verse 15 of the same chapter the self-justification again. The soldiers brought them from the Amalekai, Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord. To the Lord. Your God. The Lord, your God. He repeats that. Your God twice. Verse 20, if you were to skip down. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God, at Gilgal. In other words, what we did was fairly sen completely sensible, completely logical, and actually in keeping with what it is you, you really want, even though you gave us a different set of instructions. And perhaps the worst part of it was the fact that Saul, at the end of, of the battle with, with the Amalekites, sees fit to establish a memorial to himself. Now you say that's perfectly sensible from the perspective of the ancient Near East. You know, uh, uh, the Assyrians or the Babylonians would um, be victorious over their enemies and they would establish these uh, massive monuments upon which would be written King so-and-so did so-and-so. Perfectly sensible, right? Uh, a basic problem is did God commission Saul to bring honor and glory to Saul? And you see that Saul has the preoccupation with feeling the need to be honored. Verse 30, if you were to jump down here, chapter 15. I have sinned, not a real great uh, recognition of uh, uh, ownership, but please honor me before the elders of the people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord, your God, your God. And you say, okay, Saul. Um, it took you three times when Samuel was standing there and haranguing you and pointing out your shortcoming for you to finally say, I sinned, I blew it. And even then, he justifies it by saying, yeah, I did it because, don't you love it? Typical folks, of people who are unwilling to take ownership for their sin. I mean, to some extent or another, it's true of all of us. None of us really enjoys having someone get in our face and say, you know, you really were way out of line. Our inclination is to either say, oh yeah, well, let me tell you about you. This is what you did. Uh, or, if we're really in good shape, we'll say, well, forgive me, but I did what I did because. Which, in, in, the, in, in the case of Saul, this is what, what we see here. Finally, he says, I have sinned, but I did it because. 
and we're not talking about psychology here, folks. We're talking about a basic grasp of loving the things God loves and hating the things that God hates. A basic radical conviction knowing who God is and the fact that we are committed to living life that is in line with Him, not with our thought and perspective. You see that over and over and over again with Saul. And, and God gave him multiple opportunities. At the end of the day, God comes back and says, Saul, I'm choosing someone whom I know has a heart that is connected with my heart. Now again, as you, as you all know, David was anything but a perfect man. What he committed, the sin he committed with Bathsheba and with Uriah, her husband, was heinous, was horrendous. And scripture does not sugarcoat it. It doesn't airbrush it. In fact, uh, the word of God is very harsh in addressing David's sin and telling him that the worst aspect of his sin was the fact that he made God look like like a absolute nobody. He profaned God's name and God's reputation. However, what is polar opposite from David's response to Saul's response was the psalm that James read to us earlier. And I just want to read to you a couple of statements about that. Have mercy on me, O God. Blot out my transgression. And the Hebrew word there is literally my rebellion. Pesha. Because David knew that his acts were horrendous. This is 51.1, 51.2. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from all my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before you. Against you. You alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Polar opposite. You have the sin of one king. You have the sin of another king. In the case of one you have absolute abject repentance before God. The individual saying, God, I recognize my sin. It is ugly. Forgive me and cleanse me. In the case of the other one, it takes three efforts just to get him to acknowledge the fact that what he did was out of line and not completely in line with God's will. And then on top of that, you see this narcissistic attitude that says, uh, okay, but I'm going to have a memorial built to me. I don't know about you folks, this too is so 21st century. You know, when you think about narcissism, it's a basic attitude that says, um, I did what is right, and you should like me. Uh, and and send, uh, send a million likes and other uh, glorious comments. And that's what Saul is looking for. That's what he's looking for. Saul is not, uh, David is not because he has a heart that goes out after God. He's secure in who he is as a man of God. He has no problem recognizing when confronted of his sin. And yes, there, there are consequences for his action. But folks, let's remember that David went on to do awesome things in the kingdom of God after the sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. He was the one that laid all the groundwork for the building and the construction of the temple. Two polar opposites here about how you deal with sin when you are confronted. Do you say, you're right, I'm sorry, I sinned? Well, you say that to God. Um, 
or do you try to equivocate, justify yourself and say, uh, I did it because so and so forced my hand into doing such and such a sin. We'll be continuing to look at, at Saul and David and their example next Shabbat. Let's pause and um, take a moment to pray. Lord God, we want to be men and women who are hardcore about our commitment to you. Lord God, we pray for each one of us that you cause us to hear clearly and to know when we need to to hear the at a boy, at a girl from you and other times when we need to be confronted with our sins and our actions. Lord God, give us hearts that are soft, that are correctable, that are teachable. Lord God, cause us, Lord, to grow in grace and knowledge of you to become mature men and women of God. Lord God, we ask that you teach us to learn from from these lessons that we've seen in your word this this morning. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen.